to the Good Christophian Talks podcast. I'm Levi. This week, for our first episode ever, we've got to talk with Brother Bob Lloyd. Now, full disclosure, we're a little bit biased towards Uncle Bob and wanted to start the show with a talk of his as soon as we had the idea for this pod. I actually work at the company that Uncle Bob founded, and Chris still attends the Verdugo Hills Ecclesia, Bob's home Ecclesia. He was a fantastic presenter and devoted much of his life to teaching and traveled all around the world giving talks. Sadly, Uncle Bob passed away a couple years ago, but we're very thankful to have recordings like this to be encouraged by. And this one is a classic. It's titled Work Out Your Salvation. This was the fourth class in a series on Philippians. This talk is from the Idlewild Bible School back in 1982. This whole series is available on uh, ChristelphianBibleTalks.com, and it's all very good. Uh, But we chose this class because it has a couple of classic Bob Lloyd stories that he told for many years. It also tackles an initially confusing verse, Philippians 2, verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only is in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Uncle Bob points out that we obviously can't work out our own salvation. It's a gift from God. So what does this verse mean? Well, listen and find out. I wonder if you're supposed to give teasers on podcasts. But anyways, that's a pretty good teaser. Uh, Uncle Bob spent the first two classes in review of the Philippian Ecclesia from what we know in Acts. So class four, he's into chapter two of Philippians. You'll also notice at the beginning that he assigned a memory verse uh, that the crowd recites. So he did that in every class. So that's what's going on there at the beginning. Please keep sharing talk suggestions with us. We are always open to new talks. Uh, The email is goodchristadelphiantalks at gmail.com or reach us on our social channels. We'll list them again at the end of the show. Also, please share and subscribe, and if you write us a review in Apple Podcasts, that actually helps uh, people find the show. So yeah, write a review uh, on, in the App Store on Apple Pod, or in the podcast app on our podcast uh, on Apple Podcasts. So here it is, Bob Lloyd in 1982, titled "Work Out Your Own Salvation." Idlewild, 1982, day four. Our third period class is being given to us by our brother Robert Lloyd on the general subject of Philippians. Brother Lloyd's topic for this morning is work out your own salvation. Good morning, brethren and sisters. Are we ready to recite? Yes, sir. Okay. Is Philippians where? And it begins, I... Say it again, Philippians 4.13. Thank you very much. It was not too enthusiastic, but you got it out. I was just given by Sister Daisy Gray a little present just before I came up, a pad of note paper. It says, if everything is going your way, you're headed in the wrong direction. (laughs) It reminds me of the fellow going down the one-way street, and the police officer stopped him, and he says, don't you know you're on a one-way street? He says, well, I just thought I was late, and everybody was coming back. (laughs) This really is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God. And that's us, isn't it, brothers and sisters? There is no one on this earth has a greater right, if we have rights, to be happy than we do. It's our privilege to be happy, and it's a sin not to be, when we have so much to be thankful for. Now, you will remember... We mentioned yesterday that there were four reasons that Paul wrote, at least four, you may think of more, but we're talking about four reasons that Paul used to write the letter to the Philippians. Reason number one, it was a thank you letter. He was thanking them for the gift that they had sent him. Even though he was in prison, he says, and this is in chapter 4, verse 18, another another translation, he says, now I have everything that I want. In fact, I'm rich. Imagine he's in prison and he's saying this. I have everything I want. I'm rich. Yes, I am quite content. Thanks to your gifts received through Epaphroditus, your generosity is 
like a lovely fragrance, a sacrifice that pleases the very heart of God. So it was a thank you letter, and he was thanking them. The second reason that he wrote the letter was to fill the hearts and minds of the Philippians with the spirit of joy and gladness. And you remember we learned yesterday that there were that the words joy and rejoice were found 16 times in four chapters. I was wrong. Brother David Stiles came to me at the conclusion of the class and he said he'd found three that I'd missed. And so if you're taking notes and you want to have those marked in your Bible as well, they're chapter 1, verse 26, chapter 2, verse 16, and chapter 3, verse 3. I'll say that once more if you didn't get it. Chapter 1, verse 26... Chapter 2, verse 16, and chapter 3, verse 13. So count, add those to the 16 you had from yesterday, and there are 19 reasons, <clears throat> or 19 times he mentions joy and rejoicing. Paul really has given us the key to happiness, the key to joy and contentment in this beautiful letter. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Now, the third reason for writing the letter was to give spiritual guidance to the brethren and sisters of the Philippian Ecclesium. Although there does not seem to be any gross error in the Philippian Ecclesia like there were in some of the other Ecclesias, for example, in Corinth were some that thought the resurrection was already past, or those in Galatia who were so soon removed from him that hath called them into into the gospel of Christ, into another gospel, Paul says there's not another though there would be some that would trouble them and would pervert the gospel of Christ, there were bigger problems in Galatia and in Corinth than there was in Philippi. Nevertheless, Paul felt it necessary to warn and encourage them to work out their salvation with fear and trembling. We're going to look at that verse in detail in just a moment. But before we go back to it, we'll just briefly mention the fourth reason, which will be our subject for tomorrow's lesson, God willing. The fourth reason for writing to the Philippian Ecclesia was to appeal to them for unity, that they might be of the same mind, that they might learn how to get along with one another. Now we're going back to reason number three and to see what spiritual guidance Paul gave these brethren and sisters in Philippi guidance which very well applies to us and we need to learn and accept and put into our lives as they did in theirs. So we'll open our Bibles to the book of Philippians and we're going to look at the verse which we just quoted briefly. It's found in chapter 2 and begins at verse 12. (coughs) Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, Not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God that worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Now this verse could possibly be one of the most misunderstood and misquoted verses in the Bible as quoted by Christadelphians. We deplore the world who misuse and misquote a Bible verse to come up with the wrong conclusion. And we can be guilty of this same fault. And it's done in this verse. Though happily, even though you do misapply this verse, it doesn't create any gross fundamental error. But it brings us to a wrong conclusion as to what it means to work out our own salvation. Now, the verse is often used to be like this. Roll up your sleeves. Rub your hands together. Get ready. We're going to work out our salvation. That's how we often apply that verse. It's called by one brother, muscular Christianity. As if we could... Pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. I mean, you hear that saying, fellow, pull him up, pull himself up by his own bootstraps. It's a physical impossibility. I don't understand physics, but the, the more you pull, the less you pull the other way, and you, you can't do it. And you can't work out your own salvation by rolling up your sleeves and saying, all right, let's get to work. 
And so we have to find out just what does it mean. It's very important that we are not misunderstood. We're not saying that we're not supposed to work. Paul is saying to work. James says, faith without works is dead. So it's important that we work. But it's important that we don't misunderstand the verse too. It's a strange paradox. We won't be saved by our works, and we won't be saved without them. So now let's look at the verse and try to capture the true meaning of what Paul is saying. We're going to read it again. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure, do all things without murmurings and disputings. Now the first point that Paul is making is that they are to work, but, but not just when he's there. They're to work when he's not there too. Now there are people, you all know this, there are people that only work when the boss is around. As soon as the boss leaves, they, they stop working. Paul is commending the Philippians, but they're not like that. Paul says here, he says, I want you to work even harder when I'm not there than when I am there. So certainly he does want us to work. Now I want you to read this to you once more from another translation. Starting at verse 12, chapter 2. So then, my dearest friends, as you have always followed my advice, and that not only when I was present to give it, but now that I'm far away, be keener than ever to work out the salvation that God has given you with a proper sense of awe and responsibility. For it is God who is at work within you, giving you the will and the power to achieve his purpose. Do all you have to do without grumbling or arguing, so that you may be God's children, blameless, sincere, wholesome, living in a warped and a diseased world. Do you think Paul was talking about Southern California in 1920, a warped and a diseased world? He was, it sure fits, doesn't it? And shining there, he says, like lights in a dark place. For he says, you hold in your hands the very word of life. This Bible is the very word of life that you hold in your hands. And let God work through you, he's saying. God is at work within us, giving us the will and the power to achieve his purpose. God will work within us, through us. So that the work that we do is really not our work, it's his work. Go back to chapter 1 and verse 16. He says, I'm confident, I'm sure of this. There's no doubt in my mind, says Paul, <laughs> that this very thing, which God hath begun a good work in you, he will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So, so God has begun a good work in you and me. When you were baptized, God began a good work in your life. When you were baptized, remember how we felt. We were so full of God, so happy to be joining this wonderful family. So dedicated were we uh, to His will. Now the point is, keep that. Be like that all the time. Keep up this good work. Keep on keeping on. Not just while we're here at Bible school, but when we go down the mountain, back to our humdrum, mundane jobs, homes, whatever we go back to, we have to then continue to keep up working out our salvation because it's God uh, working in us. And you don't complain and you don't grumble and you don't argue. That's what he says. Well, it takes all the fun out of life, doesn't it? They say armies, you know, always grumble. Of course, armies are armies of men and they do just the opposite of what we ought to do. So let's see now. We're going to try to take a mundane example to see if we can capture the point that Paul is making. We're going we're to take the example of a little girl. A little girl, oh, five-ish, six-ish, seven-ish, somewhere in there. And she 
has her own little play dishes. And at times she's made mud pies out in the yard and she's washed her dishes with the hose. But now she comes to mommy one day and she says, Mommy, I want to help you with the dishes. I want to do, help you with the, the real dishes. I want to be your little helper. And so mother is impressed by this request. And so she impresses upon her the importance of being careful not to drop the good china. She gives her the, good, the best plates. And she, she takes her to the sink. <laughs> and she teaches her how to wash these dishes. And this little girl is very careful. And she washes them gently and she puts them down. And she just does a beautiful job. And she's never washed the dishes before. And she's, when she gets all through, of course, it takes twice as long as it would normally. But mommy is pleased. And she's begun a good work. She, she does it with a sense of awe and responsibility. Uh, she's never done this before. She's thrilled with the, I'm big. I can help mommy do the dishes. She's, she's pleased with this job. And that's, compare that to what Paul says. Be keener than ever to work out your salvation. That God has given you with a proper sense of awe and responsibility. She's thrilled to be helping her mother. She's careful to do it right. But now we turn the clock ahead. A few weeks, months, maybe a year. Time has passed. Now it's her job to do the evening dishes. She's to do this regularly. It's no longer a game. She hates doing dishes. So she grumbles and she argues, and she, she doesn't like it. Do these double stupid dishes. She's learned if she breaks enough dishes, maybe she won't have to do them anymore. <laughs> no awe. No sense of responsibility. Grumbling, complaining, not doing the work properly, doing it with a bad attitude, doing it poorly so you won't have to do it anymore. All right, you get in the, go to your bedroom, I'll do the dishes from now on. Wow, that's just what I wanted. <laughs> now contrast that with an obedient child who realizes that doing the dishes is a work. That has to be done by somebody. If she doesn't do it, it will fall back on mother. She loves her mother. She then does this job cheerfully, without grumbling, without arguing. As a result of this, it gives the mother great pleasure. The mother is pleased because a job that needs to be doing, done is being done well. She's pleased that her daughter is demonstrating her love for her mother. By this loving act of obedience. And this must be, this is what Paul's getting at, isn't it? Paul's point is, do all things without grumbling. This is verse 14 and 15. Without arguing. So you may be God's children. That We are God's children. We're doing God's work. Do we drop his dishes on him? Do we do God's work to the best of our ability? Or do we complain about it and, and, and mess it up so somebody says, Oh, don't you do that anymore. I'll do it after this. I know a brother who, who won't come to meeting, this was in another country, but he comes to meeting at the last minute so he'd be sure he won't be called on to pray or read because in that meeting they tell you in advance. He doesn't want to do anything so he makes sure he doesn't do anything. He plans it so he doesn't have to do anything. We're to work out our salvation, but it's God working in us. This little girl doing the dishes without grumbling... She's, she really is an exception, isn't she? She doesn't complain. She's a shining light. Did you notice what, what, we, we, what we read here? Holding forth... Let's see, where am I? Verse 15, It may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. I mean, she is different than almost all of the little girls, Right? <laughs> 
The fact that she's so obedient. But you and I, brothers and sisters, as God's children, are going to be different than everybody else in the whole world. And if we're like them and we grumble and complain and don't do the job right, you're no different than anybody else. And you have to be different. Because God is looking for people who are different. That He's called and chosen and are working out their salvation, letting God work in them and through them. We have to be lights in a dark age. It's not dark in here. <laughs> you can all see the light. <laughs> it's not very bright. The room was pitch dark. If we did this at midnight, this light would be very bright. But the point is that all the darkness in the world cannot put out the light of one match. You take all the darkness there is and you hook it all, pack it all together and light one match and the light shines. You and I, brothers and sisters, I don't care how evil this world is. I don't care how crooked and perverse it is. You and I, we are lights. And all the wickedness and all the darkness and all the evil that there is is not enough to put out our light if we're willing to shine. And that's a very big if. If we're willing to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, if we're willing to let God work in us to do His will and His pleasure. It's our pleasure to do His pleasure. As the good little girls, it's her pleasure to please her mother. And parents who train up their children in the way that they should go do not tolerate this arguing, this bar bickering, this fighting because it's wrong. And if children learn to get away with it, then we get away with it as, as adults. And we get away with it with our arguing with our brothers and sisters and with God. And if we learn to obey God's laws and we obey them cheerfully, we're going to be saved. And if we're going to bicker and fight and do a job poorly, we're going to be rejected. It's just that important. So what a responsibility we have uh, to our children. What a responsibility and what a pleasure to work out our salvation because it's God working through us. Like Jesus said at the age of 12, Wish you not I must be about my father's business. Yes, we work. Now how do we do this? We must work with the proper attitude. Chapter 2 again. We're staying in chapter 2. Back to verse 3 and 4. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Now again, you've heard these verses. You've read them. We have read, read them twice a year in our daily readings plus... Many, many other times. Uh, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in the of mind, let every each brother, brother better than himself to be. But, but let's, let's stop and take the verse apart. Let's analyze it. Let's see if what we can learn. There's two things we're not to do here. Two things not to do. One, let nothing be done through strife. Two, let nothing be done for vain glory. In the world, we have the saying... Uh, keeping up with the Joneses. Those who are striving, those that are pushing, those that are trying to get ahead, they're trying to catch up with the Joneses. Those that are vainglorious, they are the Joneses. They are quite proud of their accomplishments. They have all their possessions. And they watch the whole neighborhood trying to catch up with them. And they're always ahead. The one group is doing something through strife and the other group is doing it through vainglory. And both of those are wrong. Never act for motives of rivalry or personal vanity, says the Phillips translation. Paul gave a similar advice to this in Galatians. If you want to just turn back a couple of books to Galatians chapter 5, in verse 26, 
Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Those that are puffed up have are vainglorious, and those that aren't are envying those that are. And those that are puffed up and vainglorious are provoking the others. And all of this is unchristlike. And it's all terribly, terribly wrong. Now, it's not limited to material possessions, <clears throat> but it can include them. Again, we'll give you an example. Most of the young families will pretend in your meeting, the young married couples that haven't been married very long, but with a few little children along, uh, they've been able to, to secure two automobiles so that the wife has a car while the husband's away at work. And then s some of the families, they can't afford a second car. They only have one car, and so the wife is stuck at home with the children while the husband is away at work with the car. Well, the, the sister at home, without a car, beca can become envious of the sisters who are running around with a car. I never can go anyplace. Look at them going all around. And then those with the second car, they can rub it in. Oh, Mabel, we'd love to invite you and the children over for lunch, but of course, you don't have a car, do you? We could be so sweet in our cattiness. You see, let us not be desirous of vainglory. Let's don't provoke one another and let's don't envy one another. That's what he's saying here. Now it can have this same thing can be due not with material possessions. It could even it can even happen in the brotherhood uh, with Bible knowledge, Bible experience, a speaking ability. Those that are not invited to other ecclesias to speak can become envious of those that are. And those that are invited can become vainglorious and puffed up because they are. And it's wrong. It's a sin. We can do the right thing for the wrong reason and be sinning. And all the time we think, oh, wow, we're really working out our salvation. And the thing is a good work. Remember back in, back in, in Philippians, where there were some people preaching Christ out of envy and, and to cause problems for, 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 for Paul. He, he said this, the one preached Christ of contention, not seriously, supposing to add to my bonds. Well, they were preaching Christ. Paul was very glad Christ got preached. However he got preached, Paul was glad. But you know, these people were sinning. They didn't really love Jesus. They might have been saying all the right words. They were saying the right words for the wrong reason. And any person who is involved in the work of the truth for the reason of getting a pat on the back and getting the praise of the brothers and sisters is doing it for the wrong reason. And the right thing could even become a sin to them. And so we have to be careful how we treat one another. And not to overpraise. Because it might go to their head. <laughs> There's a saying, you can measure a man by what it takes to swell his head. And sometimes you don't have to do very much. You can just say a little thing and that head just bursts out like a big balloon. So uh, it isn't wrong to let a person know you approve of something you're doing. But be careful how you do it. And be careful if you're receiving it, how you receive it. Well, it was pretty good, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah I really got them told, didn't I? I mean, when you see that kind of attitude in yourself, you either better get it out or get off the stage. Now, the whole point of Paul's instructions is don't be like that. We're still going to stay in Galatians 5 for just a moment and go back to verse 14. For all the law is fulfilled in one word. Even in this, 
Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, that's something we all know. Oh, my goodness, that's... Which comes from Leviticus, and we know that Jesus taught it to us, and we know that James and Peter, I mean, John, everybody tells us the same thing. We should love our neighbor as ourselves. There's one thing to remember here you love your neighbor as yourself. Now, some people, and this is extremely sad, and I don't want to be misunderstood on this point either, there are some people who have no use for anyone else because they have such a poor self-concept of themselves. And if you hate yourself, it's really impossible to love someone else. Now, I don't mean by that that you're to pat yourself on the back and become puffed up. Self-concept is not that at all. Whatever you have, God gave it to you. You can't get puffed up. You've got blue eyes. Well, goody for you. I mean, you were born with them. Or brown eyes. And not that brown are better than blue, or blue are better than brown, but you could decide that yours are better, and you get all puffed up about it. And it's stupid. God gave them to you, and you had nothing to do with it. It was the genes of your parents. And to get puffed up and say, boy, am I something. i got brown eyes or blue eyes. Or i got one of each. <laughs> and there are people who do. But, you, you see, you are to love your neighbor as yourself, which means that you put them... Really, I think, ahead of yourself. Because if you love somebody as much as you love yourself, you would put them ahead of you. And so, the next verse tells if you do or not. Verse, verse 14, the law is fulfilled in one word. Even this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, but, but if you bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed, one of another. But if ye are continually wounded, wounding and preying upon one another, take care that you are not destroyed by one another. That's the 20th century New Testament version. If you're continually wounding and preying on one another, you're going to destroy one another. I mean, this happens in ecclesias when there gets to be factions and they, they, they're after each other and they, they just, the whole ecclesia is destroyed. At least their spirituality is and sometimes even the ecclesia itself. Now true love, true love for one another will eliminate all of this strife and all of this vainglory. Back, back to chapter 2 of Philippians, verses 3 and 4, and we're going to read that now from another translation. We've already read it in the authorized. Oh. Let nothing be done through strife and vainglory. Listen to this one. Never act from motives of rivalry or personal vanity, but in humility think more of each other than you do of yourselves. Think more of each other than you do of yourselves. <clears throat> None of you should think only of his own affairs, but should learn to see things from other people's point of view. Isn't that beautiful? Do you really think more of each other than you do yourself? It's not normal. It's not natural. It's not what we do. But what we do is wrong. To do this is right. It goes against the flesh. It goes against our natural desire to love our enemies, to bless when we're cursed, to turn the other cheek. These are not normal, natural things to do. But if you only do what comes naturally, you're not going to be in the kingdom. Brother Manchel talked about the two brains this morning. And if you listen to that animal brain and you just consume yourself on your own lusts and your own desires and your own appetites, you might as well be an animal and go out to the zoo and sit there like the bears do and wait for them to throw the peanuts to them. I go to the zoo and I look at a bear and I think, wouldn't that be an awful life? Imagine waking up in the morning. Wow, another beautiful day. And you can't say this is the day which the Lord hath made. I will be glad and rejoice in it. Well, it's time to go out and wait for peanuts. So the bear goes out there and looks like this. And the people come to the edge with their peanuts, you know, and they throw a peanut. Well, of course, most people can't ever hit the bear with a peanut. So the bear sits like this, and they throw a peanut, and he goes over here, and he gets it, you know, and he eats it. Then he goes back and waits. Imagine going through life 
every day after day for as long as you live, sit like this, wait for somebody to throw you peanuts. To me, that would be the most boring existence I can think of. But I'm, thank goodness I'm not a bear. And you're not a bear either. And if you only rely on your own animal instincts and you only think about satisfying your normal animal appetites, you might as well be in the zoo. And most of the people in the world belong in the zoo. Because that's all they do. They just think about their appetites. All the time. You can tell by their conversations. That's all they do is talk about appetites. <laughs> Men in dirty stories talking about appetites. Women with their recipes talking about appetites. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing wrong with a lovely recipe. Don't mind us understanding. But, but don't... We've got to sometimes think of something more uh, than these mundane things. And so, never act for motives of rivalry, personal vanity. None of you should think of your own affairs. You should learn to see things from other people's points of view. Now, brothers and sisters, if we could really, if we could really learn to do what Paul has told the Philippians to do, do you know what would happen? we would eliminate almost all the problems that we have as a family and as ecclesias and as an ecclesial world. Almost, almost, I don't say everyone, but almost all of our problems would go away if you only really thought more of other people than you do yourself. Whenever you hear of a problem, of any kind of a problem, you trace it back because we always have the excuse and we have the reason. Brother Wilfred Ali in his class this morning showed how Rebecca, she, her reason was she wanted to get Jacob out of there so he wouldn't get killed by Esau. But he, he had an excuse. And the excuse was, oh my goodness, what if, my, what if he marries one of these son, daughters of hell? Which was a very good reason too in a way. But it wasn't the real reason. And nearly always we, we have excuses and we have reasons. And if you would trace back any kind of a problem you find within a, with, a, with a husband and a wife. If a husband and wife really, really loved each other more than they love themselves, you, you didn't have problems. Uh, and you know when husbands and wives get married, the, the common thing is a husband says to the wife, Honey, oh, I love you so much. I'll, I'm going to always meet you halfway. And the wife says, Oh, darling, I love you so much, I'll always meet you halfway. And they have a difference of opinion where halfway is. And there's a gap. And there's trouble. And if the husband would say, Honey, I'm going to go all the way for you. And the wife says, I'll go all the way for you. There's so much overlap that even if they have a difference of opinion of where halfway is, or all the way is, they'll still have no troubles. It's only when, I just want to meet you halfway. I don't want to go you know, any more than that. When our kids were little, you know, I mean, you try to you give them out dishes, and they'd measure them with a microscope to see if one didn't get a, one more peanut than the other one, or whatever it was. <laughs> I mean, that's that's human nature. That's that's what we have to fight. And it's funny in our kitties, but it's tragic in adults. Chapter two, Philippians, verse twenty-one. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. It was true. It is true. All seek their own. And we have to stop. I want to read yours 20 and 21 to you again from another version. I have nobody else with a genuine desire in your well-being. Nobody else I can send, says Paul, except Timothy. Because everybody is so wrapped up in their own selves, they don't care about you. All the others seem to be wrapped up in their own affairs. Do not really care for the business of Jesus Christ. There it is. How many of you care more about the business of Jesus Christ than anything else in this world. Well, you see, I, I, I do have uh, whatever it is. There are 
people who wanted to come to this Bible school and couldn't because of some other things. Sometimes good reasons, sometimes poor reasons. Uh, we're not the judge. It's not for us to, to speculate. But if everybody, everybody thought that the business of Jesus Christ was more important than anything else in the whole world, you would ha we would have a terrible problem because we couldn't hold everybody that would be here. If they really says, I don't, I, I, no matter what happens, I'm going to Bible school because that's one of the things I need to help me in my walk for the truth and nothing is going to keep me in the way. And the boss says, you have to work. He says, I'm sorry I'm not. If you don't work, you're, you're fired. Okay, I'll find another job, but I'm going to Bible school. I, I, we've had people do that and they got better jobs than the one they lost. But you see, well, I couldn't do that. And I'm not certainly asking anybody to quit their job or get fired. Please don't misunderstand me. But he really is looking for each of you and me to put God first. Completely first. I've known of people who took a new job. And you know, when you first get a new job, you get no vacation or no time off. And the person says, I'll take the job, but I have a I, I, there's one catch to it. I want the job, I want to work for you, but I have a Bible school coming up in about a month. And I am determined I'm going to that. And so I'm, going to, I'm willing to take the time off without pay, but if I can't have that week off, I will not take the job. But I do want the job. And they got the job. You will be amazed how things work out for your best when you put God first. And how when you put self first and put the world first, things just don't seem to work out. And people don't understand it. I know a brother that always had to work on Sunday. And his business collapsed. He went bankrupt. He was putting in a business first. And he tried his hardest and it wouldn't go. Another brother lost business because he put God first. And he would not work on Sunday no matter what. And customers were mad at him. And he said, sorry, but that's not the day I go to meeting on Sunday. And if you won't see me other days, you'll have to buy it from somebody else. Some of them bought from somebody else, but his business prospered and God blessed him. It's a matter of who do you really put first? Self or God? I have nobody else with a genuine interest in your well-being. Why? All the others seem to be wrapped up in their own affairs. They're not, they don't really care for the business of Jesus Christ. Try it. Just try it. In fact, that's what God says to do. If you look at Malachi, he says, just try it. Just, just test me. Just wait and see what I'll do for you. If you just try me, just test me and see what happens. You're robbing God. We have cities in America where you're afraid to walk down the street at night because you might be robbed. But people think, well, you know, they rob each other, but you know, nobody would rob God. Oh, yes, God says, you can rob me. Oh, oh we couldn't do that, God. I mean, nobody would go, you can't, God's heaven, well, you couldn't go, you, if, if, if you could see God, you wouldn't put a gun in God's ribs and say, give me your money. I mean, you wouldn't do that. I mean, that sounds sacrilegious. God says, you have robbed me. Well, well how do we do that? Well, you put yourself first. You're cursed with a curse, all of you. He said, now you just, I'll tell you what, you just try it. You just bring to me first. Bring me your tithes in the storehouse and that there may be meat in my house and prove me and see what I'll do for you. Just try it, says God. He said, I'll open the windows of heaven. I'll pour a blessing upon you that'll be so great you won't be able to handle it. Oh, well, but, but, but God, I tell you, you open the windows of heaven first and shower me with good. Th then I'll put you first. God says, it don't work that way. You put me first, now I'll bless you. You're saying you want me to bless you and then you'll put me first. It doesn't work like that. And it doesn't. And you won't receive this huge, bountiful blessing of God until you completely put Him first in everything in your life, your money, your time, your energy, your home, your car, whatever. And when you do, He showers blessings on you that are so great you, you don't even know how to receive them all. You just, just thank you, God. Jesus said, you know, he that hath to him shall be given even more. He that hath not shall be taken away even that which he seemeth to have. 
The whole point Paul is making is that we need to put our brothers and sisters ahead of ourselves. True love will do this. If we really love our brothers and sisters more than we love ourselves, then we will care how they feel. We won't try to outdo them. We certainly would never try to embarrass them. We would never try to make them feel small while we felt big. There would be no strife. Or there would be no vain glory. Well, how in the world can you do this? This is a marvelous principle, and I, I realize that. But, but how do you do it? Don't tell me to be good. Tell me how to be good. I know I'm supposed to be good. I want you to tell me how. I'll tell you how. I'm not telling you how. Paul's telling you how. Chapter 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Again, another version. Let Christ himself be your example as to what your attitude should be. He, Paul tells the Corinthians, as incredible as it may seem, you can have the very thoughts of Christ. You can think like Jesus. If you think like Jesus, you'll put your brothers and sisters ahead of your own wants, won't you? And that's the whole point, isn't it? Christ is our example. What did he do? He did not strive to be equal with God. He emptied himself. He impoverished himself. Now, how do we do this? By esteeming others better than ourselves. We put them ahead of us. See, let each esteem others better than themselves. Look after them first. Jesus, the Son of God, did this. I don't mean you think that you think that they're... You know, if you're very conscientious and you go to meeting every Sunday and you do your Bible readings faithfully and there's another brother that never comes and you're trying to get him to come to meeting and he never does his Bible reading, you can't say, well, he's a lot better brother in the truth than I am. He doesn't know any Bible verses and I'm memorizing and I'm trying. It means that you, you elevate him and you put his desires and his needs ahead of yours. That's what he's saying. And this is what Jesus did. Jesus was hungry. He had not eaten for 40 days and 40 nights. He had the ability, he had the God-given ability to make stones into bread. You and I couldn't do that. If we were starving to death and you were in a rock pile, you could just starve to death. Jesus had the God-given ability to use God's power to sin. And you and I can't do that. But did he do it? No. He would not use that God-given ability to satisfy himself. But when he had a multitude of poor sheep, that were like sheep without a shepherd. And it was getting late. And he was afraid that they wouldn't get fed if he didn't take care of them. He commanded them to sit down. He took a few loaves and a few fishes. And he used that same God-given power. And he fed them. That's what it means to esteem others better than yourself. It means that you put their needs ahead of your needs. Their wants ahead of your wants. What they need to help them into the kingdom ahead of your own desires. You're sleepy. You're tired. It's evening. And the phone rings. And there's a sister or a brother in dire distress. They're crying on the phone. They're, they're despondent. They, want, they need somebody to come over and talk to them. Well, I'm sorry. I have to get somebody else. I have to get up in the morning and go to work. Goodbye. That's not putting their needs ahead of you. Well, I have to get my beauty rest. After all, I have a job to do. I have a family to feed. i got to do this and that. Oh, I'm so wrapped up in myself. I'm esteeming my needs over my brothers and sisters' needs. That's the way you esteem others uh, better than yourself. We're talking about difficult things to do. But we're talking about doing them. And that's important. We mean that these are not just things to talk about, but these are things that you and I are to do. We are to put ourselves out for one another. It's a life to live. To put our brothers and sisters first. Not to think of our own desires, our own comforts, our own wants. None of you should think only of his own affairs. 
But you learn, and that's that big word, learn. You have to learn. This is not something you're born with. It's not something the little child has. It's something you and I have to learn. And we have to learn it with this higher brain. We have to make this body do things it doesn't want to do. We have to form good habits of thinking of others instead of self. If this sounds like a broken record, I was talking about this yesterday. It's only because Paul is doing it. We're just taking these words out of Paul's letter to the Philippians. I mean... These are not my thoughts. These are God-inspired thoughts given to us through our beloved Apostle Paul in his personal letter he wrote to the Philippians. None of you should think only of his own affairs. You need to learn to see things from other people's point of view. It's the most difficult thing maybe we have to learn. That's the way we work out our salvation. You do it with fear and trembling. It's not like you're getting there and working away like a big, robust man doing a heavy job, chopping down a tree or something. No, you work out your salvation feeling how lowly, how weak, how inadequate you are. But you don't need to worry about your own ability, your own strength, your own wisdom, because it is God working in you, both to will and to do of His good pleasure. Brethren and sisters, we're going to close with a hymn. And the hymn has the words that we've been talking about in it. And I want you not just to sing the words. I want you to meditate upon the thoughts that you're singing so that you can live what you're singing. It's hymn 268. And just look at the last verse. We'll sing them all, of course. And then when we finish, we will stand for a word of prayer. But let each, that's you and me, let each of you, let each of us esteem his brother better than himself to be. And we already understand how we do that. We put their needs ahead of ours. Let each prefer another, full of love, that's it, we're full of love for one another. We have no envy, we don't envy them, we're not trying to keep up with the Joneses, we're not doing anything out of strife. We're full of love from empathy. And if we'll do this, we're back to yesterday's lesson. We're going to be happy. We're going to be a happy, glorious, rejoicing people. And when you think about yourself and your own needs and what you want and what you do, you're miserable. It's the most peculiar law. But the more you think of self, the more miserable you are. And the more you think of others, the happier you are. And if you want to get happy when you're feeling miserable, just go out and do something kind for somebody else and don't let anybody know you did it. Don't get found out. And you will have a joy and a peace. Happy are we when in this we all agree. Hymn 268.
great and glorious, almighty sovereign, look down and hear our humble prayer. For we seek thee, Heavenly Father, through thy Son, our Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer, that died so that we might live forever. And Father, we come before thee now with our heads bowed and our hearts bubbling over with joy, thankful that in thy great love thou hast called us, chosen us, and drawn us to thee. We thank thee for this privilege of having come apart from the world, of coming to this mountaintop to meditate upon those things that are most surely believed among us, that we might be stirred by the reading of thy word, and by hearing it taught from this platform, Father, that we might be encouraged to work out our salvation with fear and with trembling knowing that Thou art working in us, and that if Thou art for us, there is nothing on earth that can be against us and succeed. And so, Father, we thank Thee for Thy love in giving Thy Son to die. We thank Thee for His love and that He did not think of self. He did not please Himself, but He thought of us. Help us then, Father, to be like thy Son and not please ourselves, but to try to help the weak, to encourage the sick and the infirm, to give a helping hand to all our brothers and sisters, that we might join hands and walk together to thy kingdom. For, Heavenly Father, to be in thy kingdom is all our hope and all our desire. And we want to be in thy kingdom more than anything else in all the world. Help us then, Father, to keep things in their proper perspective and put this world and its lusts and affections behind us and seek first thy kingdom, for we know that thou hast promised that thou wilt give us the things we need. And we know that thou knowest our needs better than we know how to ask. And so we thank thee for the blessings which thou hast showered upon us. We pray that Thou will keep us safe until the coming of Thy Son. And we pray that at that day that we may receive His approval and hear those words, well done. For this truly, Father, is all we live for. This is our hope and our desire. And we offer our prayer and we give Thee our thanksgiving through Christ Jesus our Lord, ascribing unto Thee, Thou who art able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy. Unto thee, the all-wise God, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Thank you for listening to the Good Christadelphian Talks podcast. If you haven't already, please subscribe on Apple Podcast or your podcast player of choice. For show notes and links to the talk you just listened to, visit our show page at anchor.fm slash gct. We encourage everyone to share their thoughts on the talk from this week on our social media pages. We are at Good Christadelphian Talks on Facebook, Instagram, and at GCT underscore podcast on Twitter. If you know a great talk, we want to know about it too. Send any suggestions to goodchristadelphiantalks at gmail.com or message us on social media. If you know anyone who wants to listen to more good talks like you, please share the podcast with them. Thank you for listening. God bless, and talk to you next week.